chat as they come up during the talk. Um, we will read the questions aloud at the end um, of the talk and we'll do our best to get to all of them. So we are here tonight um, as part of our community wide read one book one Beaverton and in celebration of Brian Stevenson's moving memoir just mercy. We are pleased to have Elisa Kaplan with us to talk about the death penalty in Oregon. She is a law professor at Lewis and Clark Law School and director of the Criminal Justice Reform Clinic. She serves as counsel to the Forensic Justice Project and co-founded the Oregon Innocence Project. Welcome, Eliza. Hi there. Um, thanks so much for having me tonight. And I thought what I would do is um, go through some of the basics about Oregon's death penalty uh, and the death penalty in general. Um, and so bear with me, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, and so we'll have something to follow. That should work, do you, can you see that? Okay, great. Um, and um, I'll, at the end, I have a slide that says questions, and that's when we can move to any questions you have. I'll do my best to answer them. Um, so Oregon's death penalty um, is actually a very, very interesting issue, especially in the last 10 years or so, but also historically. Um, before I get into any details of that, I want to give you a little bit of the national landscape on the death penalty. So here's some information, um, and this includes Oregon in here, but 28 states and the federal government have the death penalty, including Oregon. There are 22 states that do not have the death penalty, and I won't read them all off, but you can see all the, um, the abbreviations of all the states with no death penalty. 12 states have the death penalty, but they have not executed anyone in the last 10 years, and that includes Oregon. 172 people have been exonerated from death row. They were wrongfully convicted, wrongly imprisoned, um, and they spent time on death row. That's including five people this, just this past year. And I always wanna say about innocence, um, most of you read Just Mercy, so you know this, but as someone who was an innocence lawyer for many years, there are tons of innocent, innocent people on death row, off death row, all over the place that just, we can't prove it, which is why they're not exonerated, but they're still there. So 172 is quite a large number of, uh, of people that we could prove. The number of executions peaked in 90, um, at 98 people in 1999, around, that's the entire country, dropped to 35 by 2014, and there were only 17 executions in 2020. And interestingly, you've probably seen some of this on the news lately, there have been 10 federal executions in 2020. Um, it's the first time in US history, right, that the, uh, that, the go that the federal government has executed more people than all of the 50 states. And it's the highest number of federal executions since uh, Grover Cleveland was the president. So it's been a really, really big year at the federal level for executing 10 executions and then seven was the total number from the states. Prior to 2020, there were no federal executions in the United States since 2003, and only three since we reinstated the federal death penalty in 1988. Lisa Montgomery was um, executed this week. Um, she's the first woman to be executed in 67 years. And there are two more executions scheduled before January 20th when we change administrations. So sort of added some of that stuff because there's so much going on at the federal level. So when I talk about the death penalty, whether it's with my students, um, you know, my son, <laughs> groups of people, the three areas continuously come up, right? What are the practical pros and cons? What are the legal pros and cons, legal issues? And what is the moral 
um, you know, issues involved that um, affect us. And, you know, as someone who studied the, has studied the death penalty and represented people that have been on death row, um, as recently as last year, my law clinic had a parole case of somebody who was previously on death row. Um, and um, what you see is all three of these considerations are constantly at play with our death penalty, whether it's in whether we should have one or not, whether it's how, if we are gonna have one, what does it look like, whether it's in how we actually conduct executions, if we, if we do have them, how often, what are, what are the mechanisms of doing it? Um, the legal issues are endless and have been since we've had a death penalty. Um, and the practical issues of, you know, what does it look like to execute someone and how much money does it cost? And all of those things are constantly at play. The moral issues, obviously, people's religions come into play. The innocence issues come into play. There's a lot of, there's so much in the death penalty and there's so much for everyone with all different varying opinions on different things. So these are all the things that sort of come up. And here in Oregon, back in 2011, it's sort of the beginning of major change in our sort of modern history of the death penalty. And that's when Governor Kitzhaber um, said, these, this is a quote from a speech that he gave, the practice, um, in, in practice, Oregon has an expensive and unworkable death penalty system that fails to meet basic standards of justice. 27 years after voters reinstated the death penalty, it's clear that the system is broken. So in even that statement, you have all of those considerations. Um, and this is what leaders you know, deal with um, when considering their role in the death penalty. This is what voters consider. And Oregon has had one of the most sort of interesting, I'll use that word, um, flip floppy uh, history. Um, of the death penalty. And as you can see, I won't go into what was happening during all these times, but as you can see, going all the way back to the mid 1800s, we've just keep going back and forth. Um, we also have the death penalty in our state constitution, which not all states have, which means that the only way to officially get rid of it, if that's something that we wanna do is to vote it out through a referendum, um, a ballot measure, or if a court finds it unconstitutional. Those are the only ways. So what you see in our history is the back and forth, the voting for it, getting voting to get rid of it. You see some, uh, the United States Supreme Court and then the Oregon courts have found it unconstitutional as written, but then it gets reinstated and we've gone back and forth. Um, and during um, all of this time, you can see it's almost the way I try to describe it is like we want to have it, but we don't really want to use it that much, right? Um, and so, as you can see, even prior to the moratorium that Governor Kitzhaber declared in 2011, which still stands today under Governor Brown, she extended it in 2015, we have only executed two people in the last 50 years in um, 96 and 97. We have only executed two people and both of those people, um, they gave up their appeals, which means we call them volunteers. Um, and they basically said, I'm not gonna appeal my case and so just execute me. And so basically, it's really unclear whether we would have had we would have executed anyone if they were still going through the very long process of uh, being, um, you know, being sentenced to death and then actually being executed. Um, it's it's a, it's years and years and years. So that's the history. So. As you can see, let me just go back here. As you can see, in the last 10 years, things have changed, um, or at least since we reinstated it in the 80s. You know, things have changed that we are now, um, although we are still a death penalty state, we're in that group of 12, and there's 12 that have it but don't use it. 
And there's 22 states that have gotten rid of it and many in the last 10 years. So, you know, how did, what's changed? How have we gotten here? Um, and, you know, these are the things that I sort of think about when, when I think about, I go back into the 90s when I sort of started my career as a lawyer. And I remember clearly, I'm from the East Coast, and I remember clearly um, we, I, we had a governor in New York running on the death penalty. That was, you know, in the mid 90s, it was, you know, it was all the politicians, the Democrats also were all both sides, very, very pro death penalty, very pro punitive measures and sentencing and uh, mandatory minimums and all of that, right? The eighties and nineties. And so since then, what's really happened that has changed our minds on a lot of issues or opened our minds to on a lot of these issues um, and with regard to the death penalty, I have to say that I think the wrongful convictions issue and that 174 people um, and the awareness that we get it wrong at least that often, especially there's been a few states where they've had numerous wrongful convictions um, from folks who are on death row. So I think the whole um, awareness that we wrongfully convict people you know, not just people that we put on death row, but the thousands of people that we've now proven that were innocent is always gonna change people's minds, open people's minds, maybe their hearts to the fact that we get it wrong that often. And those are just the ones that we can prove should we really be making decisions on executing people. So the wrongful convictions issue, I think was sort of the beginning of people questioning a lot of our criminal justice policy, including the death penalty. I think the cost has become a really, really big issue. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the cost in Oregon, because I did a, a very, very big study on it a few years back. But that's a huge practical consideration that states are spending a ton of money on having a death row, on all of the numerous appeals, and the way that the US Supreme Court requires us to um, provide different levels of protection for people. Um, there's so many different costs involved with maintaining, a, you know, a death penalty. Um, and many states started looking at that cost and saying, Do, is this money that we really want to spend? Um, the history of the death penalty comes, as I showed you just in Oregon, but it's, it's pretty fraught all over the place. And there's a lot of flip-flopping, there's a lot of changes in the law, and I think that is another issue as people learn about it, they get like a little uncomfortable maybe. The racial justice component, there's numerous studies showing that both who we sentence to death and who we execute, um, it's disproportionate to black people and people of color. We've had in the last 10 years, um, especially the last five years, a brand new um, wave of prosecutors that are not pro death penalty that are saying, I don't really want that tool in my toolbox. I don't need it. It's not worth it for all these other reasons. Right. And finally, you know, there's a, over the last 10 years in particular, I like to say the pendulum swinging from the eighties and nineties. And we've swung to a place where because of all these things on the death penalty, because of all these things on all of criminal justice policy and punitive measures, there's a real rethinking of mass incarceration. There's a real re-examination of, is, should we still be doing what we were pushing for and all these laws that we passed in the 80s and 90s, including all the death penalty measures? Um, is that really where we wanna be today? Did that keep us safer? right? Are those the right policies? So right now, we're in a real moment of questioning a lot of those things. Um, so all of these, these areas, um, these, the, these issues, I think, have led to a lot more public awareness um, and a lot of rethinking of, you know, the death penalty. And if we're going to have it, what does it look like? Should we even have it? And that has certainly been true in Oregon. So here in Oregon, this is our statute, our aggravated murder statute. Until 2019, people that were convicted of aggravated murder um, 
were eligible to receive the death penalty or life without parole um, or another type of life sentence. And a, um, in every single aggravated murder case, a person would basically have two trials. They would have one to determine guilt or innocence, and then they would have or acquittal. And, that, or, and if they were found guilty, they would have another one to determine their sentence. So right there, just putting cost in your brains, we don't need two, of, two, uh, two full trials when we, have, when we don't have the death penalty, right? Um, and then there's about 10 layers of appeals after that. Um, the Oregon statute up until 2019 allowed for the death penalty when, there, when um, up to 19 aggravating factors were present. These are just some of them. Right, like based on, uh, you know, how the murder took place, who was the victim, just there were 19 and we and over the years we just kept adding on to them. So um, it really put t almost every murder pretty much ended up in the aggravated murder realm and was eligible for the death penalty. And then all of these protections kicked in. Right. So there's been a lot of talk over the years. Should we have this? Shouldn't we have it? What should we do? It's in our constitution, right? And so one of the things I did, because as I mentioned before, is I did a cost study. And this, was, this has been happening in a lot of states. And I guess the way I always think about it is, you know, your moral belief um, in something or what you think is right and wrong is not going to convince people who have a different moral belief, right? But why don't we look at some of these practical considerations? Wrongful convictions is always one of them on the death penalty, but also cost. And when I was working on this, we were in an economic crisis um, where we couldn't, we didn't have funds for all sorts of things, including many things in the criminal justice system. So it was really an interesting time to look at how much money we were spending to keep about 35 people on our death row. And another thing before I go into the cost is over Oregon's history of having the death penalty since 1984, and we'll call that sort of the modern time, we had a reversal rate of people's sentences and or their conviction of close to 60%. So people would get convicted, they'd get sentenced to death, then they would start their appeals to the higher levels of court. And 60% um, of the death sentences and or the actual conviction for aggravated murder were getting knocked down by the higher courts for various reasons, for problems that happened at the trial in both of the trials, with the lawyering, with the way a court interpreted parts of the statute. So we weren't just having the cost of a case going through the 10 layers. We were having the cost, we were, we, we have to deal with what happens when you go up to three layers of appeals and then you get knocked down and have to start over again. And then you go, another case makes it to eight and then gets knocked down again. This was continuously happening because of how the statute was written, because how it was being interpreted, because of the lawyers working on both sides of the cases. There were so many things wrong with how we were applying the death penalty that the courts um, at every level above the trial level were knocking it back down. So I, with um, a bunch of my students over two and a half years, it took so much longer than we thought <laughs> it would, went deep diving into the data of how much it costs, right? And our goal was to um, estimate costs associated with these aggravated murder cases that resulted in death sentences versus the costs in all the other aggravated murder cases, right? So we did that. We reviewed hundreds of aggravated murder and murder cases just to have sort of a apples and oranges also from 2000 to 2013. 
We also looked at appeals of aggravated murder cases from 1984 when we first put it in place until 2000 that resulted in death sentences. Um, and just to give you some of what we found, these are some of our pretty graphs, but we found that you know, the average cost per sentence, and this is excluding the Department of Corrections costs for housing and stuff, is, you know, look at this big difference. This is death, life, less than death, less than five, pending as other. That's because those are all uh, being questioned at the time of the study. Um, you can see it in some other ways. You can see the change in cost of the death penalty by decade. 80s, 90s, 2000s, right? Um, so basically, you see that our results, you know, showed us that um, the cost for aggravated murder cases that resulted in death sentences ranged on average from 800,000 to a million more per, per case when compared to a similar non-death aggravated murder case. I always like to show all this stuff because I think as taxpayers, we don't really think about how much we're participating, uh, whether you agree morally or not, but we're all paying to have a death penalty where people are being reversed 60% 60, 60 of the time and costing us a ton of money. So I like to think that the cost played a big role in us changing our laws significantly in 2019 in a bill called Senate Bill 1013. And um, basically our, leg our state legislature decided that we're not gonna totally get rid of the death penalty. We can't by statute. As I mentioned before, it can only go away completely if we vote as the public votes on that, or if our courts or the US Supreme Court find it unconstitutional. But um, a law was able to pass in 2019 um, that limits aggravated murder charges to defendants in just a few circumstances. So remember I mentioned before that our aggravated murder law our, our prior one had, there was 19 situations where if you committed the horrendous crime of murder with any of these aggravating factors, you're automatically eligible for the death penalty. Well, this new law basically narrowed the factors, changed the law in a few other ways, um, but the biggest thing it did was narrow it down to murder cases that are very specific, right? To defendants who have killed two or more people in a terrorist act, children under the age of 14, correctional officers or other inmates while incarcerated already for a murder conviction or police officers. And this will allow, this narrowing will make it so very few people only only people that fall into this category, right? So up to five, you know, is sort of what we averaged um, could be eligible versus the 30 to 50 that we were producing pretty much yearly, whether they ended up on death, you know, death penalty or not, it was a different thing, but that's how we would start these cases. So we've really limited it, right? So um, because of the law, um, there was a handful of folks that were still on appeals because of all those reversals. So seven people automatically became non-death cases. We now have 28 people currently under death sentences. And this last May, um, the Oregon Department of Corrections actually got rid of what we call death row, which was a special area in the Oregon State Penitentiary that just housed death row and moved people into the general population. Um, and that's a, that's a ton of money savings as well. So these are all the changes and kind of where we are now with Oregon's death penalty, a really, really different place. We still have a moratorium. Um, but those 28 people are still in their appeals and um, 
you know, um, there's probably not any that will get to an execution date anytime soon. Plus, um, at least for the next two years, while Governor Brown is the governor, we have a moratorium. Another governor could come in and could change that. Um, and then people will start being eligible and have execution dates. But for right now, we're sort of on hold with everything. And that's where we stand. And I think that's my main overview. And I'm happy to talk about these issues, take questions, hear what people think. Thanks so much, Eliza. Um, there were a few questions that came in Great. through sure. the chat. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the first question is, do you expect the federal death penalty to be overturned with the new administration? And has the federal death penalty flopped like Oregon has at all? Like flip flop back and forth. Again. Yeah, good question. We've had a we've had a federal death penalty in place pretty straightforwardly, but also haven't executed anyone in a long time. So in that way, it's similar. There has already been legislation introduced to get rid of the federal death penalty. I my opinion is that if that can pass um, in both houses, that uh, that. Uh, President-elect Biden would probably sign it. Um, but I do know that that under a new administration, even if a law like that doesn't pass, we would likely go back to where we were before, which is have a death penalty, um, a federal death penalty, but not ever use it or use it only very, very rarely. Um, and you know, one of the things that was so horrible about the last year or so with these cases is um, lower court judges in many instances didn't wanted to sort of slow down the um, cases. So, for example, in Lisa Montgomery's case, a uh, federal court in Indiana, and this included Trump appointees and Obama appointees, whatever, all the different judges really felt that she should have had a um, more opportunity to have, um, you know, all the checks on her mental stability. Um, she had a lot of trauma and um, suffered a lot um, with her mental health. And she was ordered the, the day before her execution, a federal court order to ha have her go through more um, examination of her mental state. And it went right up to the Supreme Court and they said no. So you know, the cases not only were got to the death penalty, but they were handled incredibly harshly by the by um, Trump's US Attorney's Office also. Um, and at a minimum, that will not happen. Um, I, but I do think that there is a lot of hope that um, Congress could pass um, a law that could get rid of the federal death penalty. So I guess we'll see soon enough. Um, do we know the racial makeup of the people executed? Is there a racial disparity? Um, in general, in Oregon, uh, any specific? Yes, the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> the racial disparities, though, it's really interesting, both in Oregon and in most places, isn't just about who, who gets executed. It's often about who gets um, even eligible for the death penalty. Right, so a lot of studies show that it's not just who ends up getting executed, but for example, when it's a black defendant and a white victim, right, versus a black defendant and a black victim. In the first situation, that person's gonna easily be eligible. It's so the racial issues and the disparities come in at sort of every place in the process um of the death penalty in most states or ones that i've most of the ones i've looked at and there's also a real disproportionality among counties both here in oregon um historically um and in most in most states 
Um, some the statistics are really interesting when you look at a couple states that the majority of uh, death cases come from two counties, right? In the whole country, actually, but then in, within a state, it's one specific area. And so you can see how much power a prosecutor has in those instances because they're making the call of the charging. Um, so that then becomes, there's all sorts of racial um, disparity in those decisions right from the beginning of a case. Um, the next question is, what is the suspected cause of the peak um, of executions in 1999? Um, it's the 90s. <laughs> a lot more states having the death penalty, a lot more states thinking punitive measures are the way to go. Um, no moratoriums. I mean, we just, it was like a cranking system and that was the peak of it. I remember it really well, actually. Um, it was just, I remember, um, this is like a little, uh, you know, per, more personal story, but I remember I was, on some street corner handing out flyers against the who, the person running for governor in New York at the time because they were pro death penalty and I wanted someone who was who was against the death penalty. And I remember it I was I was the crazy person, you know, everybody was for the death penalty back then. Everybody. It was just the norm, you know, it was the norm and that's how we handled all matters of criminal justice. That was the peak of mass incarceration. It was the peak of mandatory minimums, the late 90s, you know, the mid to late 90s. Um, we were just in that moment. And most every state was just cranking the death penalty. There was a few exceptions. Okay, the next question is, are the cost um, of, the, of the death penalty cases essentially court costs over all the years of the original trial and the many appeals? Yeah, there are a lot there, yes. So, you know, the first big costs come, um, the US Supreme Court has set some, some parameters about the levels, of the kinds of appeals over years, they've set these sort of parameters of what is required in death penalty cases. Death is different, right, is the language from the Supreme Court. And states then go back, they have their laws, and then they put in place these sort of mechanisms. And then over the years, litigation, state litigation, federal litigation has led to sort of creating what's what has to happen, what's the minimum requirements. Um, and so um, in Oregon, for example, as I mentioned, you know, as soon as you become death penalty eligible, you automatically move to having these two, this is, you know, um, it's a little different now under our new law, but historically since the 80s, you moved into having these two trials, right? One for guilt, one for your sentence. And you're provided a team of lawyers and investigators and, you know, inv you know to, to do all of these things, mitigators um, and, so automatically that kicks in. They start preparing your case. The prosecutor may have put death on the table to get you to plea down because 97% of our cases plea down, right? But right there, those costs, even if you end up taking a plea and never going to trial, all those death uh, costs kick in right there at the beginning. Then if you don't plea and you move forward and you go through the process, and you get convicted and sentenced to death, you then have these 10 layers of different types of potential appeals to bring. And yes, at each one, you have your team and each one you keep going and it takes a hundred years, I'm exaggerating, but a really long time. And then the courts strike it down because of all the issues I mentioned before, and then you have to start over. So it's really what I call process. And in our study, the costs included defense, prosecution, the prosecutors spend a ton of money investigating these cases, right? They're the state too. Uh, prosecuting, investigating, everything relating to put on the case and everything related to defending the case. Um, and that's at every level, right? It includes court costs. Um, one thing we looked at that was really interesting was that death penalty cases have you know, five times as many hearings as a regular, 
felony case, right? Pre-trial hearings, all of that, you know, everything from courtroom time, judge time, prosecutor time, defense time, you know, at every layer this is going on. So the costs all come in there. And then of course, there used to be specific housing or just housing people in general in prison and all of that. So the next question starts with a quote from Sister Helen Prejean. Uh, it says, what the eye does not see, the heart cannot feel. Um, and then goes on, to, <clears throat> goes on to say, she said her job is to bring people inside the execution chambers and to give them facts about the death penalty. Education is what changes minds and hearts. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, um, she's amazing. <laughs> um, you know, I find, so the work that my clinic does is we do clemency cases, we do parole cases, we do some stuff with forensic science, wrongful convictions. We have a program in the youth prisons. Uh, we provide legal services um, through the Oregon Youth Authority. Um, and we chime in on all different legal issues and cases and do studies and reports and stuff. But, you know, the way my whole philosophy with my students and in general is that, and, you know, I've spent more than 20 years of my career in prisons um, representing people, you know, in these various capacities. And I think Brian Stevenson says this, and I believe this deeply, which is, you know, no person is you know, they're one bad act and these are humans. And so it's about, the, it's about showing people the facts, but it's also about having people realize that these are human beings. And even if they've done horrible, horrible things. Um, and I don't make excuses for people who do horrible things, but I do believe deeply that people can change almost everybody. And um, you know, especially with the death penalty, it's when you have a death sentence, you can't, it's really hard to change because that's always hanging over your head. Um, and there's plenty of, you know, prison's the worst place in the whole world and being in prison for the rest of your life, which I'm not, I'm not pro either, um, is in some ways worse than the death penalty. <laughs> so there's just so many issues, but I think really what it comes down to is, you know, these are humans and, um, and most of them, if, you, if I sometimes have trouble reading our petitions and the things we write because of the childhood trauma people have been through, um, because of the experiences people have had leading up to their crime. And again, it's not an excuse, but um, it does provide some context of why people get to a place where they end up committing a horrible crime. Um, you know, in Lisa Montgomery's case, if you haven't read about it, there's been a lot about her story um, that is really worth reading because, you know, that's the person we just executed. Somebody that suffered so much trauma, was sexually trafficked, was abused her entire life. Um, and, you know, rather than try to heal her before she committed a crime or even after she committed a crime, we end up, you know, as a, as a country, we ended up executing her and that's on all of us. So, you know, I, I won't go on, but you know, I have a lot to say about these things and I ha I'm really fortunate because as a lawyer, I have gotten, you know, hundreds of people out of prison that either didn't commit the crime or did commit the crime, but had changed themselves. And, you know, and I get to teach a whole bunch of amazing students to, to do the same. So I'm really, really fortunate lawyer. And what I consider the most fortunate part of my job is all of the clients and people that I've met that are incarcerated. So it's just, so I'd like to bring everyone to prison is what I'd like to do. <laughs> And meet and meet all my friends. 
Okay, the next question is, can you tell us more about the organizations you work with and what some of their current work is? Yeah, I did that a little, I think. So the clinic at the Criminal Justice Reform Clinic here at Lewis and Clark, um, I started it about six years ago. And, you know, the main mission of a law school clinic is to train people to be lawyers. So I get second and third year law students and law school's three years, if folks don't know. So I get students in their second and third year. And unlike an internship or an externship where they go to a law office and they work for a lawyer or they follow people around and do work for them, um, the students in the clinic under training with a lot of training and supervision represent clients on their own. Um, so they're the lead, basically. You know, if we've done everything right, when we get to the parole hearing and what we've submitted to the parole hearing, it's all the student. And they've been trained to properly represent someone and they've done all the interviewing of the client and they've drafted all the legal materials, et cetera. So a clinic is like a very hands-on um, learning and teaching experience. And the students, as I mentioned, we represent people on parole, which in Oregon are people who have committed murder and they were convicted at a very specific time in our history before we had mandatory minimums or before we had measure 11 and they're coming up 25 or 30 years later to the parole board. Um, and we represent people in clemency where we're asking the governor to commute someone's sentence um, as I mentioned, we have a youth legal clinic for incarcerated youth where we help with legal navigation and know your rights and help them do legal research and fill out forms and understand what happened in their cases. Um, and then the Forensic Justice Project is, I think you're going to have a speaker in a couple of weeks, my colleague Janice, um, who's amazing. But that's an organization that she'll explain more, but we focus on looking at how forensic science played a part in either getting the wrong people in prison. So looking backwards at cases, how you know did we use bad science to convict someone and how do we get them out? But also to train lawyers and judges and work on cases on the front end that have a forensic science piece, which by the way is almost every single criminal case these days. How do we make sure that the people using, talking, um, and convicting people and defending people, how to make sure they all understand the science and how it implicates in a case to make sure that we're not wrongfully convicting people using bad science or bad experts testimony and things like that. Um, and then we also have our big project that we have this year is called the Ramos Project. Um, and my clinic was really involved in getting rid of non-unanimous juries in felony cases, which we had in Oregon for 85 years. Um, and we won at the US Supreme Court last spring. And now we're working to help prisoners apply to have their cases potentially vacated based on the US Supreme Court law. So that's a temporary project um, because the laws changed. So the, the, that's what we do at the clinic, which always exhausts me when I talk about it because it's so much, but, um, but it's wonderful. And, um, and the students are learning a ton and the students are walking people out of prison while they're law students, which is kind of incredible. Um, and so we've been really, really fortunate that um, we've had a lot of traditional success, although we define success a little differently in the clinic, but we have had a lot of traditional success, which is a lot of our clients have been getting out of prison in the last few years. So that's what we do. We also collaborate with tons of other organizations, um, obviously in Oregon on different issues, especially with COVID and the prisons, we've been doing a lot of collaborative work. That sounds like amazing work. I'll just yeah, it is amazing. <laughs> I'm lucky. Yeah. Um, the next question is on the subject of mass incarceration, what are other alternatives being explored and where would someone like Dayton Leroy Rogers fit in? Dayton Leroy Rogers. Okay, well, first of all, let's talk about mass incarceration a little bit. So as I mentioned, you know, the pendulum has swung, right? 
or a swinging. And um, as I'm constantly warned by my elders, my, my parents, it's going to swing back. So quickly get in there and do as much as you can. And you never know when it's going <laughs> to go. Um, so, um, you know, the pendulum has swung. And I think that part of it are a lot of the things I mentioned before with regard to the death penalty, but it works for all these issues. And when I started working on innocent stuff um, back in the late 90s, before it was so popular and everyone knew about it, and um, it was a really interesting time. And I was there at this sort of beginning of like, I, as a lawyer, a new lawyer figuring this stuff out, but also seeing sort of the public starting to figure it out. And the amazing thing about wrongful convictions is that it sheds a light on so many problems in the system, right? And innocent people are compel people who don't care about these issues to care. So you kind of had this, um, this moment, right, where people were like, oh my God, this is happening. Oh my God, I had no idea. Oh my God, we, we identify people wrong all the time. People falsely confess. Prosecutors are doing terrible things. Defense lawyers are terrible. Like all these different issues are sort of uncovered. The light is, was, you know, um, wrongful conviction shines a light on all the problems in our system. And so, you know, starting sort of there, um, in the beginning of the 2000s, as more and more people started getting out of prison, it started having people question, you know, what can we, like, is, is all, are all these laws we created in the 80s and 90s, are they keeping us safer? Are they better? You know, are, is the world and what we wanted from all those laws, is that happening? Can I walk down the street more? Is there less crime? And what we kind of learned was that that's not really what makes us safer. Putting tons of people in prison isn't what makes it makes us safer. Um, and that we're our communities, you know, crime goes like this for a lot of different factors. And imprisoning people for crazy long periods of time and these consecutive sentences and these Measure 11s and for, you know, not in Oregon but in a lot of places for. Um, you know, small drug possession and things like that. It just wasn't um, doing what um, everyone said it was going to do. So it created these openings to sort of rethinking these issues. Um, and so what's happening now? Well, a lot of things are happening now. I mean, Oregon is at the forefront of some of these things with Measure 110. Um, not, let's not put every single person in the, let's not solve all of our problems with the criminal justice system. So in addition to harsh penalties, the answer often in our society is, how do we solve that? Well, let's arrest them and put them in prison, right? Um, and I think now there's so much more of an awareness that there's, it creates an endless cycle of poverty. It has so many racial injustice issues. Um, and it doesn't solve the problems in our communities. Um, so I think what we're seeing is People are trying other things, right? Like, let's not put everyone in prison because they they have you know some drugs on them, right? Let's. Uh, I think the whole marijuana legalization thing is part of that. Um, let's not you know put everyone on death row. We just passed an incredible juvenile justice bill in Oregon that dramatically changed the outcome of what will happen to youth that go into our system, rather than everyone going into adult court and getting charged and sentenced with these long mandatory minimums, it's not up to the prosecutor anymore, right? It used to just be up to the prosecutor. Oh, they did this, they're going there. Now, if, if a prosecutor wants a youth to go um, to adult, um, you know, to adult court and get charged for adult crimes, they have to go through a judge and a judge has to hear why. If not, they go to the, the youth system and they get treated like the kids they are. So there are lots of things happening in our system um, that are very, seem really positive. It doesn't feel fast enough, right? There are certainly some efforts in this upcoming legislative session to make some changes to Measure 11, which is amazing. Um, we passed the, de changed the death penalty law. We changed the youth. Um, 
the juvenile, we passed the juvenile justice law. So there's definitely a lot of things happening here in Oregon um, and around the country where people are just re-examining things. And it'll be interesting to see how far we can go before the pendulum swings back. Um, and, you know, we'll see. I think the more data we have, I think is really hopeful to sort of show what works and what doesn't work. Okay, so we have time for one more question. Um, and that is, you mentioned that the source of death penalties in Oregon is interesting. Uh, which counties send people to death row? Can you elaborate more on that? Yeah, um, I don't have all the stuff in front of me. And also, by the way, if I didn't get to your question and you want to ask me anything or chat about, you can email me. Um, my email, I think, is on that was on that last page of the presentation. Um, or you can give it out. I'm always happy to talk about these issues. Um, yeah, it you know um, the death penalty um, is used like so many other um, punishments. Um, historically and still today in places where, where they use it a lot. So if someone's committed a horrible crime, um, you know, again, so much is in the prosecutor's hands, right? The prosecutor is the charger. So they get to decide, you know, is this a death case? And just because something meets the exact requirements doesn't mean of a statute, doesn't mean that the prosecutor can't have a conversation. We plea 97% of our cases. Everyone does. That's a whole other presentation and conversation, <laughs> but that's how our system works. So there's so much discretion at the beginning of a case in the charging um, that you just see in counties around the country, you can look, there's been amazing studies done that actually just pinpoint, right? Um, wh who are the prosecutors over the years that are, are calling on the death penalty every chance they get? Um, who are the ones that are using it to plea down someone, right? So they don't get a trial. There's all, people have done such incredible work at looking at individual counties. Um, and there's a county, I want to say it's in Georgia, and I'm sorry, it's not where you would think, like it's not in Texas, I think is what I mean by that. But I think it's in Georgia where that for years and years, it was the most, it was the county that had the most death ca cases. And it kind of wasn't what you'd expect. And it was because the prosecutor there for years and years and years, often prosecutors last for a very long time, um, it was the number one tool that he liked to use in his tool chest and the law in the state allowed that. So um, there's some amazing studies on looking at county by county around the country. Oh, thanks, you put my email there, I appreciate it. One more, or are we done? Uh, I, think, I think that we're done. Okay. Um, just to, for time wise. Yeah. Um, sure. I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight, Elisa. It's really thank been Thank you great. so much. It's really fantastic. And thanks to everyone in the audience. Um, and just as a reminder, we still have lots of great one book programs happening in January. Um, just to highlight a few, this Saturday, we're having um, an event called Mercy Me, which is a live storytelling event with four really great tellers. It should be a very, very fantastic evening. And then at the end of the month on Saturday, January 30th, we'll have a closing keynote with Bob and Singh of the Oregon Justice Resource Center. Um, and that should be a really interesting talk as well. And you can register for those events online on the library's website. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Everyone Thank stay you. safe. Yeah.